Tonight's episode of Legacy Battle is brought to you by Atlas Benefits. Atlas Benefits has solutions for your insurance needs. Atlas Benefits can help you obtain Medicare, health, or life insurance, and employee benefits. You can find them on the web at www.atlasbenefits.com. Or you can contact Rob Ducey or Roy Smith at 727-600-2892 and mention Legacy Battle Podcast. Atlas Benefits has all the solutions for your insurance needs. Enjoy the show. This is Legacy Battle. Make sure you hit that subscribe button on YouTube, iHeart, Amazon Music, Spotify, Apple, Podnods, you name it, we're on it. I'm Michael Adams, creator of Legacy Battle. My panelists tonight from the Gridiron Battle Zone, Brian King from Steelers Nation South, Rollo Coughlin, and Ball State Athletics, Paul Havocott. Our special guest tonight, we're joined by a boxer with a career record of 41 5 and 1. He's got 22 wins by KO, he's got a silver medal from the 92 Olympics. He's a three-time national amateur champion, WBO and IBF heavyweight champion of the world. And he won <laughs> he didn't just win those titles. He won he won that title beating Klitschko and Hollyfield <laughs> win those titles. So uh that's pretty impressive. Ladies and gentlemen, the champ is here, Chris Bird. Chris, thank you for coming on. Yeah, thanks for having me. Appreciate it. Let's get it. Awesome, man. Yeah, you, you didn't back down from some of those big names. That's <laughs> that's awesome. So we're going to have a Q&A, as always, for Chris uh, after our debate. Tonight, the topic is boxing's greatest upset. And we're going to start this off with uh, Iron Mike Tyson versus James Buster Douglas. So go back with me to 1990 in Tokyo, Japan. Tyson was set to fight Buster Douglas. And uh, I think Mike's overall presence was a lot more dominant than Buster's at the time. I think he was 37 and 0 with 33 knockouts. Uh, James Douglas was 29 4 and 1 with 19 KOs, ranked seventh at the time. Mike was a lot more heralded going into the fight. Held the WBC, WBA, IBF titles. He had a lot of stuff going on though in his life. Definitely some drama. There's some well documented Robin Given struggles. Contract battle between promoter Don King and manager Bill Clayton. And Tyson had left his longtime trainer, Kevin Rooney, uh, around that time. So in the first two rounds of the fight, Buster just appeared to come out a lot more aggressive and quicker. He was described by the commentators as more agile than Mike. And by the end of the second round, Buster finished by delivering a vicious uppercut to Mike. So it, it looked like it stunned him. It looked like things were kind of going south. Uh, Tyson comes back, lands a very left, uh, heavy left-sided body blow to Buster in the third round. But Buster was pretty effective and overpowering all the way until the eighth round when Mike seemed to kind of be fighting for his life and knocked him down with a right uppercut. And that's we'll, we'll earmark that because that comes around later on. But the round ended with a bit of controversy, and uh, a count began on Buster. But the fight moved into the ninth where Mike's eye eventually gave out and closed up permanently for the remainder of the fight. So the fight ends up ending in the 10th by KO when Buster landed an uppercut and then a series of combo punches, putting Tyson on the mat where he was counted out. And so I looked up a couple interesting fight notes about this, but where I mentioned earlier, Tyson's camp led by Don King immediately protested the result, claiming that Douglas had been given a long count by referee Octavio Mirren. And the WBA and WBC initially agreed to, you know, and suspended the recognition of Douglas as the champion, although the IBF immediately accepted the result, said it was valid. And after a public outcry and demands from boxing commissions around the world, they ended up acknowledging Douglas as the champion. The protest was withdrawn and Douglas was recognized four days after the fight. In spite of Douglas's, you know, kind of inspired and just overall dominant performance, a sizable number of boxing fans still view the fight and the outcome as, I don't know, sort of like an aberration. 
uh, a lot of rematch talk and stuff like that. As a 42 to one underdog, Douglas earned 1.3 million from that fight, and Tyson still got a cool six million. So that's what happened in Tokyo. That's my uh, upset fight. So, Chris, everybody's seen the long count, of course. And the thing that got me was, if I'm recalling correctly, they didn't even have a cut man for, for Tyson that night. Like, they're using rubber gloves filled with, like, ice and water. To they weren't prepared. No, they, they were they, there's prepared. a lot of commentary on that. He, the corner looked lost when he would go over there because they didn't expect right. it to go this, this way. So, so your, your thoughts on the long count? Did you think it was legit and also – I mean, how important is it to have, like, the proper ring men there with you? Well, you got to think about Mike Tyson at the time. Do you really think Buster Douglas, Buster Douglas is going to go that many rounds? Nobody thought that. Mike Tyson my favorite fighter. I mean, he's one of the top. I mean, a top guy. I, I've seen Mike since, you know, I was 11 years old at Junior Olympics. He was 15. I watched him fight. So that count, of course, it was a little long. The, the referee was surprised. He's like, I did Buster Douglas make it to 11th round. You know, it, it's crazy. So, <laughs> stuff happens. They try to, it's a Don King card. They try to push Mike to keep, keep that belt. Even though, if he would have got up, what was going to happen? He was get knocked right. out. So, <laughs> right. it, it was a shock to me. That was the biggest upset ever because that, that was in my time. And I'm and I was a huge Mike Tyson fan, and that was. Let's just call it now, Chris. It's the biggest upset ever. Let's just call it now. Ever. Hey. No need. See you guys. Good night. Yeah, it's the biggest. <laughs> it's the biggest to me, man. I, I still tear up when I see it. I'm like, oh my goodness, that's my guy, Mike Tyson. What well, and, and how much do you think, uh, like having a new trainer and all that, affected him for that fight? When he's when he's at his height, I mean. That pit bull, you can't stop him. And from the beginning, you, I seen the whole just, I'm like, this is not the same guy. And, and, and it did affect him big time because of everything that's going on. And plus, he's the world's most famous athlete. Because think yeah. about it, what's coming at him? And he's young. Like, what, how old was he, 22, 20, what? Mm -hmm. He's yeah. around the 20s, yeah. yeah. Probably 25 by then, I think. Well, wow. 25, I mean, he's a – I mean, that's Mike Tyson, man. It's He has so much coming at him so fast. And, you know, it's, it's crazy because I was heavyweight champion. I wasn't that popular. But just a glimpse of what Tyson was going through, I'm like, wow. Imagine Mike at his prime, man. How can you focus on fighting when – Everything is thrown at you at all times, right? So, you know, and that, and from that fight on, just downward spiral, just because of all the stuff that's coming at him. I mean, it, it's hard. Well, Twenty three uh, years old, by the way. Twenty three. Oh, okay, twenty three. Twenty three. Let's move on to Sonny Liston versus Cassius Clay. Oh. Ooh. February twenty fifth, nineteen sixty four. <clears throat> Uh, Sonny Liston was the baddest man in the game at that time. He had won 28 of his previous fights, 23, which came as a result of TKO or knockout. And, he did, I mean, he had destroyed Floyd Patterson in the two previous bouts, knocked him out cold first round. So he was, he was dominating. He had an 84-inch reach, and he strengthened his neck. He had a strong neck because he strengthened it by standing on his head for hours at a time so <clears throat> you know he was he was at the top of his game but uh in addition to him being at the top of his game and where he was uh he also had mob, uh, ties to the mob so a lot of people were afraid of him you know because of his dealings with the mob so people were afraid to step in the ring with him and people were afraid of him because of his punching power but Cassius Clay wanted him he called. He kept calling him out. Called him out for almost eighteen months. He called him out. So he wanted that fight. And Cassius Clay was only twenty-two. He called him an old man. He was twenty-two. Listen, was thirty-one. He was calling him an old man. He was calling him ugly. He called him an ugly bear. You know, he poked and prodded him until Listen uh, agreed to the fight. And so, you know, and Clay was. He had just been knocked out or knocked down in his previous fight against Henry Cooper. So people thought that because of that. He still had no chance against Liston. Uh, 46 of the sports the sports writers who covered the fight, 
43 of them that had called that uh, Ali would be, or Clay would be knocked out um, by Liston. Um, but, you know, he, he came out with a, with a game plan that he was going to, he was going to toy with them. And he did a lot of that in the ring. Uh, you know, he called, he said it before the fight, float like a butterfly, sting like a bee. And he did that. He danced around the ring. He, 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 he poked at him with the jab and just basically uh, picked him apart. Um, and then in the fifth round, <clears throat> which was, which was, you know, it was a little bit of controversy. Uh, Ali actually was, was kind of blind. He said he was blind because either A, Listen's corner had put something on his gloves or, or uh, something that was on his cut had got into to Ali's eyes. So for much of that fifth round, he couldn't see Listen. So he was, he was basically walking around. He was putting his hands on his head because he couldn't see him. He couldn't determine where he was. And so in that sixth round, once he got his vision back, that's when he basically picked him apart. And after the sixth round, because Liston was basically flailing around, throwing wild punches. He had injured his shoulder, and he couldn't come back out for that fight. So <clears throat> that was that was one of the greatest upsets because of you know who he was at the time. He was 22. He was young. He was the Louisville Lip. He was going around talking trash. And Liston was the bad guy. He was aggressive. He was always getting arrested. And Ali came in to pick pick him apart. Chris, with uh, we know Cassius Clay would become Ali, maybe arguably the greatest boxer of all time. So because we know that that's what he became, does that maybe take away a little bit from the upset factor, even though at the time it was a big upset? I, I don't think so. I mean, he was <clears throat> open to that fight. They, they thought that man was going to get killed. You know, he's fighting, he's fighting Sonny Lewis, the the true bear that kill you. Like, he was the Mike Tyson of the time. So it was a humongous win, big upset, but not bigger than the, the Tyson, you know, the Buster Douglas Tyson to me. Understood. So, I mean, with Ali, I mean, the guy has just transcended the sports world probably more than anyone maybe other than Michael Jordan. I mean, was this a guy that, that you kind of looked up to? I know you said Tyson was your idol, but uh, was Ali somebody as well? Oh, yeah. Oh, definitely. Just looked up to big time. I think, um, of course, the years away from boxing stole a lot from him because he wasn't as sharp as when he came back. But, you know, Muhammad Ali politically made him humongous. His stance, and, and actually later in life, and it wasn't like when during his time they hated him, but later in life they understood and like, mm, okay, he's standing for something. So with with that coupled with boxing, you know, being, he the one said he was the greatest, so that's why he's the greatest. That's <laughs> why he's the greatest. He said it, so everybody went along with it. Okay. It was, it was after that, that It was after that fight that he famously hung out with Mar Malcolm X and became, changed his name after that yeah. fight. It was after that fight that he became Muhammad Ali. Very true. <clears throat> that's just Marcellus Clay before that, yep. Well, let's move on to Lennox Lewis versus Hashim Rahman. So, April 22nd, 2001, it's our uh, most recent fight we're talking about tonight. It was called The Thunder in Africa. So we had Lennox Lewis, who was the unified WBC, IBF, IBO, lineal champion. Uh, he had 20 to 1 odds uh, uh, against Rahman. And just, just uh, before this fight started, Lewis was a little fixated on the super fight with Mike Tyson that was supposed to happen and the super payday that was going to come with it. Um, but Tyson got this, the three month suspension at that time for a marijuana test. So Lewis basically fought, I don't want to say like a no name, but he fought Rahman and this was kind of like just for him to keep fresh during this break until Tyson could come back. So we go into this fight after four rounds, Lewis had a 39, 37 uh, scorecard lead. In the fifth round, though, Rahman, he just took over, knocked Lewis out, scored the huge upset. A little bit about this fight, too, though, is there was a lot of reasons as to why Lewis might have lost this fight. And I want to throw some of them out here. Um, you know, a lot of people say that Lewis didn't arrive to Africa in time to adjust. The, the sea level there is 5,200 feet above sea level. 
Now, Lewis couldn't get there in time to adjust because he was too busy filming Ocean's Eleven out there in Las Vegas with George Clooney and Brad Pitt. Um, so a lot of people say that was part of the problem. Um, also, like the time, the time change, they say, messed with him, too, because they were fighting like around lunchtime. And this is, uh, you know, a guy who's used to fighting, you know, late at night. So they said that was possibly affected him. Um, and then, of course, you know, the big one is he just overlooked him. Lewis <laughs> just kind of was looking ahead to this fight with Tyson. Um, you know, Lewis, in his fights, he would average over 60 punches around in his fights normally. In this fight, he was averaging barely 40 punches around. So there was something that was going on for sure in this fight. And it wasn't just Rahman's defense or anything like that. So, um, but they did end up having a rematch in which Lewis just pretty much pummeled them in four rounds. So, uh, Chris, your, your, your thoughts on this one? Um, not as big Vegas-wise, 20-1, to 1, as some of the other fights. But uh, Lennox Lewis was a great champion. So what are your thoughts on this fight? Oh, it, it was, at the time, it was a huge upset. I mean, it was huge. Hassan Rahman is is one of the young heavyweights. We always we always waiting to beat Lennox Lewis. It was a hundred different heavyweights that was coming up. It was heavyweight fury, and Lennox Lewis was the guy. And Hassan got him in Africa. I'm like, wow, that was a big one. I mean, me and my wife, I can still remember we watched that, and when he got that one punch, oh my goodness, he changed the whole landscape of boxing. Because at that time, the older heavyweights, especially like Evander Tyson and especially Lennox Lewis, nobody could touch us. We're, we're the big three. You, you're not going to beat us. And especially Lennox Lewis at the time because he was the arrogant one. And all us young heavyweights were just waiting, okay, if we get a chance with Lennox Lewis, man, what, what's going to happen? And Hussein Rockman blew it out of the park. They knocked him out. I was like, dang, he got him first. So... That was a, a major surprise, major upset in boxing. And a lot of money came uh, his way after he won that fight. Uh, Showtime was trying to sign him, and uh, uh, Don King was got, trying to get a hold of him, too. They were all trying to set up future fights, but it is what it is, and uh, he, he lost that rematch to Lewis. But let's move on to our final fight tonight. That's going to be Sugar Ray Robinson versus Randy Turpin. All right, so yeah, Randolph Turpin. So Sugar Ray Robinson, widely regarded as the greatest pound-for-pound boxer in the history of the sport. Uh, from 1943 to 1951, he was routing a 91-match winning streak. He was 128-1-2 and two professionally uh, up to that point in his career with his only loss coming against Jake LaMotta and he ended up not only avenging that loss once, he avenged that loss five times, just proving that that was a complete fluke. So he was 30 years old at the time, and so very, still very much in his prime. Meanwhile, you got Randolph Turpin. Um, he was not really seen as much of a threat to Sugar Ray. Uh, he was the champion of England, but no English middleweight had, been, had won the world title in 60 years. Um, you know, many felt like this match wasn't going to be close, and a lot of fans were openly questioning whether Turpin was even going to get through the fight without being injured. Uh, another thing to note um, before I get into the fight was it was scheduled for 15 rounds, and no one had ever been able to go the distance 15 rounds against Robinson before. So, to everyone's surprise, when the match opened, it was Turpin and not Robinson who was the aggressor. Uh, he cut off the ring on the champ and forced him on the defense regularly. Robinson was unable to figure him out, and he took heavy shots from Turpin, like the one in the tenth, which opened up a gash on Robinson's left eye. Entering the final round, Robinson's corner was desperately yelling for, for him to KO Turpin because that was the only chance that they had. They knew they were that far behind on a scorecard, but the champ had nothing left. Uh, Turpin had not only taken the legend the distance, but he overwhelmingly won the fight, breaking, the, like I said, 91 consecutive match winning streak and becoming the first English middleweight champion since 1891. So this was just an amazing upset. 
I actually represented Sugar Ray Robinson uh, on our Brian Minto show when he came on. This guy was just an absolute stud. Chris, if you win 91 fights in a row, I mean, when you lose, that that's making headlines. That That is huge. Oh, big time. Big and, time. Yeah, so I know this is obviously way before all our time, of course, but, you know, what, what are your thoughts on – just one uh, achieving such a great record, and and they were fighting way more often than what we see boxers fighting today. Big time, yeah, big, big time. I mean, they, they fought a lot, and you know, in that fight with with Turpin, taking nothing away from him, I mean, he I watch it. I'm like, man, he aggressive. But look at the size. When you move up in weight classes, I don't care how good you are, you could be the best. It still takes something away from you every weight class you go to. Now you're going up. Randy Turpin was so much bigger and muscular. I'm looking like, man, you know, and taking over control of the fight. And, you know, and they fight a lot. It, it's a lot of wear and tear on you. But, man, it was just Turpin time, man. He had, especially in that first fight, he had it going on. Like, he was catching with certain shots, picking you apart. And Ray Robinson couldn't do the same things he did a normal opponent. Yeah. Well, let's move into our vote here, guys. Can't vote for your own. Paul, who are you taking? I don't usually do this, but I'm just throwing a vote out there. I'm going with Brian's Sugar Ray because I'm so – I can't vote for mine. I'm just so confident Chris is going to vote for mine because he, he's smart and he knows that it's, it's the biggest upset. <laughs> Brian? Brian? Well, I mean, I, I remember when I was a kid and then watching Mike Tyson, and I mean, the guy seemed like invincible, like a you know a cartoon character or something. Just like it was just unbelievable. And then for him to be laying there on the mat, which is something nobody ever really thought they were ever going to see. So, got to go with that one. Rallo, I watched that Tyson fight. I was, I was in high school, and uh, just a bunch of us it was a crowd, and I remember when Tyson went down. There were people crying. <laughs> there were people crying. Like that's how much it affected them. But he lost. So that is my that's my vote right there. Yeah, I'm gonna make it easy. It's Tyson for me. Chris, you sticking with Tyson or you changing? No, nah, it's Tyson. I was the, I was one of the, the people uh, I had tears in my eyes. I guess I cried. <laughs> <but> I <didn't laughs> <have to> cry. <laughs> Did you ever think the fight would be overturned? Did you? Were you hoping for that? Oh, oh, yeah, but at the same time, I, I was thinking, man, if it get overturned and they had to do a rematch, I might do it again. I mean, because he beat <laughs> Tyson bad in that fight. It was really bad. That wouldn't be good. All right, so uh, that's a win for Paul tonight, Tyson over Douglas. So, Paul, with the win, you get first question for our Q&A here. Well, I, I share something with you, Chris. I, I am a huge Mike Tyson fan as well. I know he's had a lot of troubles. I'm disregarding all that. I've, I've enjoyed watching him grow. And I read his book, and his, there's some great uh, Don King stories, obviously, in that book. But uh, you signed with Don King in the early 2000s. Would you care to share what you're you, – you seem like a really nice guy. What would be a good summary statement of what it's like to be repped by Don King for those of us who haven't uh, ever been graced by his presence? Well, as my wife would would or my ex wife now would say about Don King, he's an evil genius. That's that's what he is. I mean, he is a smart man, but he he's an evil genius. He is. That wraps up Don King, really. <laughs> Rollo, then Brian. So you took on the Tally Klitschko fight on really short notice. Were you prepping for an opponent prior to that, or were you just in training and they you got that call? Like, what was what, what was going on when that when you got that call? Yeah, I was prepping. I was prepping for. Uh, I was like a, a month and a half out from a, a fight I was getting ready to train for, and the guy I was fighting, uh, I forgot his name. He was like five ten, so and he he was a former amateur. He was a lighter weight, like a. a a junior middleweight, then through the years he got he became a heavyweight. So I never heard of uh I mean I heard of a tally Klitschko, never heard of his brother, but I didn't know he was, you know, six, seven and a half. I 
I didn't know his record or anything. He was fighting over in Germany. I didn't worry about that at the time. And then he, when I get a call 10 days notice, I'm like, yeah, I'll fight him. I don't care because I, I had lost to Ike Bayabuchi two fights before that. So I wanted to get I wanted to get back on the world map again and, and prove that I'm a true heavyweight, like a heavyweight contender, one to be reckoned with. I didn't know anything about this big guy. And I get to Germany, 27-0, 27 knockouts. I'm like, man, at the press conference, I was going out. Look how big he is. <laughs> it was crazy. It was so crazy. It When I got in the ring, the crowd laughed. They laughed at me. They looked at it. We got to the middle of the ring. Everybody started laughing. I'm like, oh, okay, give me four rounds. Give me four rounds. If I get past the fourth round, I'm in this fight. And and that was a wrap. I, I was in the fight. <laughs> so, Chris, you, you won the heavyweight title three times. Uh, you know, versus Klitschko, versus Maurice Harris, and versus Holyfield. Which one of those wins to you was the most satisfying? Actually, I won it twice. Maurice Harris was for the number one spot. Actually, for number two spot. Oh, okay, okay. I stand corrected. Okay. So, um, um, I don't know. I, I think uh, both of them were – were it, it, it's crazy because it's two different scenarios when it comes to the title. Ten days notice, it's like – it was, like, mind-blowing. But, honestly, to answer that question, uh, it was when the IBF title because I fought my way to it. Like, I had to go through Maurice Harris. I had to go through David to a two top guys. Nobody wanted to fight at the time. And I'm thinking – Man, I fought my way to this, and it was to Lennox Lewis. And my lawyer told me he got turned down. He don't like fighting lefties. I was on fire at the time, and I'm like, I'm gonna be the best heavyweight in the world when I beat Lennox Lewis. The littlest guy in the division is gonna be the best guy in the in boxing, in boxing, not just heavyweight boxing. That heavyweight champion, the best in boxing. I'm like, I'm the smallest heavyweight ever, undersized, doing my thing. So. Man, I think the Evander Holyfield fight, it it, it really, when the IBF title really submitted, you know, what I really wanted to do because Lennox Lewis was the man and he didn't want to fight me. I don't care what they say, Don King say, what Lennox say, what anybody. We, we know in boxing that man didn't want to fight me at that time. He just didn't. I was on fire and I'm left-handed and, you know, I'm a tricky guy, man. I'm, I'm I'm super slick. I'm the slickest ever. So, you know, it, it, it it's the second fight, man. So I want to take you to Madison Square Garden, your one lone draw in your career against Galata. I've seen the fight. On my scorecard, I had you 114 to 112. I know the judges, one had it even and one had you and, and one had Galata. I just wanted your thoughts on the fight. I mean, did you think that you had it won? No. No? Okay. Yeah, I'm thinking this is close. I didn't know if I won or lost. I just know it was close. You know, in that fight, I promised Don King something right before I went uh, to the ring. And I and I seen Don King in the in the walkway when I was warming up, looking depressed. The fight before I fought uh, was Fresno Kendo, John Ruiz, and they were booing like crazy in the garden. And I'm main event in the garden. I'm like, no, this is where Ali and Frazier, I mean, Ali and, and Frazier fought the biggest fight ever. And I get a chance to be, and I said, Don, I told Don, and I walk away, I'm going to save your show. I'm going to save it. And I know he was looking at me like, wait, you the smallest heavyweight in the division. How you going to save my show? You, you don't slug. You, you're a boring fighter. If you notice, I fought back. Like, I didn't stay in the middle of the ring. I, I wasn't slipping. I was trying to fight back, and the crowd loved it. That's the one time in my heavyweight career where the media really praised me and saying, man, this was a great fight. Chris Berg came out of his shell and started fighting as a heavyweight. So I did save his show, though, because people were excited. And I, and I, but I almost lost my title. Ugh, it was close. <laughs> All right, one more each, guys. Make it your best. Same order, Paul, Rollo, Brian, me. Yes, I, this is the perfect question for you because you have experience with both, but Klitschko brothers, 
never fought each other because they made a promise to mom. They talked about it. I think Vladimir said he he's more technical, but the other brother was stronger. So if, hypothetically, and, and you were the youngest of eight children, so you must God knows how much you got picked on. But uh, if you if you were to pick a winner of those two fighting, since you have experience with both, who who would it be? Honestly, I, I would go with uh, Vitaly. Even even though he's quit in the ninth round and Vladimir beat me twice, it's just a different just a different circumstance. With Vladimir, I'm too small. It's just he he used that to his advantage. Okay, I'm a big, stronger guy. Vitaly, smarter, better. I mean, I I frustrated big time. I just feel like he's a tougher guy and he. He a, he a guy that go get it. Yeah. Right. Okay. Um, yeah. I uh, I read that your father began training you at age five to become a boxer. Um, were your other brothers and sisters, were, were they boxers as well? And, and do you attribute your success uh, to, to the early start that you got in boxing? Oh, that, I wasn't good when I was young. I wasn't. I, I was the type of kid. I mean, First of all, I'm the youngest of eight kids, five boys that box. We all box. And my sister was a world champion also. She was actually three-time world champion. So being the youngest, I had a view from the bottom. As I kept growing, my brother Patrick, who's a year and a half older than me, he was a stud. They call him the, the Sugar Ray Leonard of boxing when he was 12 years old. They were like, man, he's that good. So I just followed him. Everything he did, I'm like, wow. And then when I seen Mike Tyson when I was 11 years old, that really inspired me. Like, man, at the Junior Olympics in Colorado Springs, I really started liking boxing a little bit more, but I really didn't care. I mean, only time I really cared was when I seen Mike Tyson. I'm like, oh, because I followed his amateur career. And it made me want to, you know, spark up. But then, you know, my brother Patrick was the main one that really inspired me to go to another level. And, you know, just pushing me, we pushing each other. He he become number one in, in, in amateur boxing. And I'm like, whoa, he makes it. And I'm like, I, I want to be the best. I'm sorry. I'm talking. I forgot the question. I'm just talking about this stuff. <laughs> uh, it's all good. So, you fought lightweight, you fought middleweight, heavyweight. You know, what weight were you most comfortable fighting at? And and how hard is it to keep up weight? Oh, man. My best weight is where I'm at right now. Honestly, it, I weigh like 160 pounds maybe, maybe a little less. Um, I fought at 165 at amateur. I moved up. I won a silver medal in the Olympics. I moved up a year before that, so I really was no uh, middleweight, a 165 pounder. And I thought I was gonna get signed to a promotional contract and a managerial contract at that weight class. Nothing happened for me after the Olympics. Nothing. No, <laughs> nobody can. I won a silver medal, and I didn't get signed by no. The, the focus was uh, Oscar De La Hoya. He won the gold medal. His mom died right before that, and he had a great story, and they focused on that, made him the gold boy. They forgot about, you know, me with the silver medal and Tim Austin, who won a bronze. And that year, we, we only won three, three medals in 1992, and that was a gold, silver, and a bronze. So Oscar was a golden boy, and he... He proved that he was a golden boy. You know, he's a great fighter. But for myself, I got left behind. I mean, really forgotten about. I mean, literally. People don't even know I fought at middleweight and won a, a silver medal in Olympics. People that that was in boxing, that, that's still in boxing, they still don't know or remember. I'm like, really? That was one of the proudest moments of my life, representing my country in the Olympics and win the silver medal. And... Come back to boxing and nobody and nobody remember me. I'm like, wow. And, and then get forgotten about. Fight at home two in two of my my first two fights. I didn't get paid. Nobody showed up to the fight. And I'm thinking, <laughs> I'm an Olympic silver medalist. What? So I out of depression, I go to heavyweight. I didn't know what I was doing. I didn't even know if I was gonna fight. I finally, you know, it was my brother, he go out and ask. Asked some people in our uh, in our hometown of Flint, Michigan, 
ask a person named David Sage for some money just to help us out. And he said, I don't have much money, but I have a venue. I can put on, if I get some help, I can put on some shows. And that's when knockout promotions get started, man. I'm fighting a heavyweight. I'm scared to death. I'm like, I weighed 193 pounds, my first heavyweight fight. Because cruiserweight was 190 at the time. So that was considered a heavyweight. So, man, I was so scared. I never fought that weight. And then I just started making my way. I'm fighting at a nightclub. It, it, it's about... <laughs> 400 people, maybe 300 people in this smoky nightclub. He said he had a venue. So that was the venue. <laughs> and, and, and I fought my way out of the nightclub. Look at that picture behind you. I fought my way out of the nightclub, fought my way out of this part, this little venue, this venue, everywhere. Just I'm fighting just to make my way. I'm an Olympic silver medalist and nobody remember me. Nobody know me. I'm like, what the heck is going on? Make it. I made my first fight in the nightclub made six hundred dollars. My last fight I fought there seven times. I made twelve hundred. I made a thousand dollars, and then the most dangerous fight of my career was like I think in my fifth or sixth fight. I fought this guy was a super heavyweight when I was fighting amateur. I was fighting one thirty nine at the time. I'm fighting him. I'm like a heavyweight, <laughs> a monster, and. That changed my life at the heavyweight, you know, division. I started fighting on USA Tuesday Night Fights after that. And getting a break, man, I'm getting breaks here. I, but I fought my way everywhere. And everybody started seeing the talent. I didn't have the power because I'm a middleweight. But they seen the talent. Like, okay, this dude got skills, though. He still, he might be a little bit boring. He might be taking his time. But he got skill. And he got toughness. That's one thing. I'm fighting for my life, man. I had a... I just got married, had a brand new baby. So my whole thing was I got to win every fight and, and try to win impressively. And I know I'm moving on a little further, but in my career right now, coming back, it, I'm going through the same thing. At first, they said I was too small. People laughed at me, literally laughed. You're going to get killed. you get hurt. Now they say I'm too old. You're going to get killed. You're going to get hurt. And I'm like, I heard this in my first career, the same thing. And I did, I won two world titles. I think this is about to happen again. I just feel it. You, you look like you could hang up here and go into the ring right now. Even as you're answering the questions, you're bobbing, you're weaving, you're ready to go. You might as well just break the news right now. Who's it going to be? Who are you coming back to fight? Who are you going to show that you're the king to? Come on. Honestly, honestly, I want to come back, fight every major champion in the division I'm fighting in. I mean, I can fight from 147 to light heavyweight. I just want to make great matches and show people you could do you could do anything at this age. I'm 51 years old, and I'm coming back to, to claim what's really mine, those titles at middleweight, either junior middleweight or super middleweight. That was supposed to be me. I followed all those guys, so it was time to get it. So the comeback is real. real I'm quick, glad. Real quick. Well, I know you were going to log off here in a minute. But <clears throat> what was your purse for the Klitschko fight, the first one? Uh, okay. Tally. What was your purse for that? How much did you make for that fight? 200000 Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. <That's it. laughs> We had a fight. You, yeah. you took it on seven days, ten days before. Ten days no. ago. They should have paid extra. Look yeah. at it. Yeah. 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 200000 wouldn't even get me in the same building. <laughs> <laughs> and you take away all, knock all my teeth out, knock my ears off. And no, I don't want that $200,000. <laughs> <laughs> Chris, that was absolutely awesome. Thank you so much. That that was really enjoyable. Yeah, uh, me. I appreciate it. We're looking forward to that comeback. That's going to be great. Uh, I can't wait to see that. So yes, yeah, it's going to be fun. It's going to be so much fun. I'm going to put on a clinic. Clinics. I believe awesome. you. I'm rooting for you, man. Hey, thank you. I appreciate yeah, it. Yeah, big really fan. Thanks. Everybody, make sure you hit that subscribe button. Thank you for watching, and we'll see you next time. Have a great night.